This is tonight. I'm Bruce Whitfield. The last time we had Martin Meredith in studio talking about his book, The Fortunes of Africa, we spent a long time talking about the first 4,950 years of the book. Uh, the last 50 or 60 years have been particularly interesting as well, and that is post-independence Africa, and that is when the Germans pulled out. So they were kind of forced to. The Portuguese pulled out eventually by 1975 from Angola and Mozambique, and of course Britain in the 1960s began to uh, withdraw from its empire as well, and the French around the same sort of time from particularly North Africa and from East, uh, from West Africa also made a similar retreat. So what about post-colonial Africa, and what do we learn from 5,000 years of African history as to what the 21st century and beyond looks like? Martin Meredith is back with us. Colonial Africa, I suppose the colonial period officially ends on this continent in 1960, 62, 63. Yes, I mean the first black African state to gain its independence was what has now become Ghana, used to be known as the Gold Coast, uh, which gained its independence in 1957, and, but a lot of others followed in 1960, and most by 1964-65, more or less the, all the British and French colonies uh, that they had controlled for a period of about 70 years were under the rule of in, uh, indigenous politicians. Uh, and you're not very nice about the indigenous politicians because you talk about how um, when independence comes and they've been the big political promises and the big uh, and this big desire to achieve great dreams, post-colonial dreams. But um, the French left no universities behind, the British left a couple behind. There was no real sense of great education. There wasn't really a base for successful post-colonial states. Yes, the conundrum for the colonial powers was whether they handed over in independence to political movements demanding independence or whether they were going to face the possibility of a local insurrection. The French had the experience of Algeria, mm -hmm. which was a, a, a disaster which carried on for eight years or so, um, a rebellion which cost the lives of uh, more than a, a, a million people. And everybody was t petrified, or all the colonial powers were petrified, that if they didn't give way, um, uh, then they would face a kind of similar insurrection. So uh, African independence movements gained power with very li limited uh, preparation. Uh, the British in, in West Africa were at the forefront of uh, developing local administrators uh, and indeed Ghana at the time of its independence in 1957 was one of the most prosperous tropical countries in the world. Mm -hmm. um, the sad thing is is that that was uh, soon more or less destroyed by the antics of a whole range of, of African leaders. You, um, you call them, uh, as many people do through history, the big men, the Idi Amins of the world who emerge in this post-colonial period. Well, I Idi Amin in a sense came from a, almost a second phase. Sure. The first phase was a period of one-party states and one-party rule. Um, and in Ghana that was the kind of the experience that they had and they dissipated all the wealth as it were that they'd had and built up within eight years of, of, of independence. What then happened because of, of the ambitions of a whole range of military men um, including Idi Amin, mm. um, it was the military men who came to, to the fore and Africa was then kind of overwhelmed by a whole set of coups and counter coups and so on and, um, and any sort of sense of orderly administration was really confined to a relatively small number of, of African states. Um, Botswana is a kind of is a good example of a mm. well-managed African state which has used its diamond wealth to good effect. Uh, but Idi Amin um, and the sort of big man kind of rather like him um, grabbed power in kind of military coups um, and intended to hand on for as long as they uh, as, as long as they could. As so po post the 1960s, we go into probably four decades of almost consistent civil war across so many of these countries. There were civil wars breaking out and military coups breaking out all the way kind of across Africa, one after another after another. Uh, and it was the, the problem was con compounded by Africa's role in the Cold War, the, the, the rivalry between the West and the Soviet Union. And both sides, the West equally, and as the Soviet Union tried to recruit to their own side uh, African leaders, some joined up to the West, others uh, uh, to the Soviet Union, some tried to play one side off against another, um, which meant that basically the West, as much as the Soviet Union, 
tolerated the emergence of military dictators and despots merely because they supported whichever side um, uh, they wanted to. One has to look close to home in South Africa and one looks at the, the civil war in Angola which raged for three decades and um, there was the Cuban supported Dos Santos uh, government and the South African um, US backed uh, forces of, of Jonas Savimbi for example. I mean that is probably the closest we came to home and, and alongside with uh, Mozambique of course uh, of, of similar dynamics. Yes. Uh, the British and French transfer of power was relatively orderly. The, the, the people who mismanaged the continent, sub uh, the, the countries that subsequently uh, were African leaders. In the case of Belgium, it was disastrous right from the, almost the first day of independence. The Belgium Bel and Portugal as well. I oh, indeed. Mm -hmm. But whereas Portugal decided, uh, sorry, whereas um, uh, Belgium, the Belgian authorities decided to hand over power more or less with virtually no preparation. There, there were no army officers mm. or there were no doctors. The largest body of trained people in uh, the Congo um, in the weeks running up to independence were in fact Catholic priests. Um, it's not a very uh, sensible way to kind of hand over power <laughs> to a, a country which is soon riven by not only kind of um, indigenous civil conflict, by the, but the prospect of a Cold War inflagration. The Portuguese tried to hang on, uh, fending off by military means um, uh, the, the attempts by African nationalists to kind of to track them out. And when they uh, uh, eventually kind of uh, were forced out in 1974-75, uh, there was an equally kind of disastrous uh, uh, consequence. We look at the dawn of the 21st century and this dawn of great hope for the African continent and suddenly people have begun to realize, the world has begun to realize, that this remains an extraordinarily resource-rich, arable continent that is fit once again, hopefully not for the same degree of exploitation of the last 5,000 years, but perhaps for maybe a cooperative 21st century for Africa. Or is that too hopeful? Um, it's part of the, uh, uh, of the reality of what's going on. So you had sort of four decades, more or less, of economic decline and instability, which affected most of Africa one mm. way or another. The end of the Cold War brought a, a, a major improvement in the way that African states were run, if any, because they couldn't raise money without actually improving their own systems of government. Suddenly you see democracy begin to emerge post the 1990s. Yes, or a form of democracy. Yeah. Very often it wasn't proper democracy, and, and it was very often kind of subverted by ruling elites sure. for their own purposes. But there was a significant change really in 2000, going into the 21st century. And that was the consequence, really, of China's growing economic might and the demand that China had for African commodities, which led to a substantial increase in the price of commodities, whether it, it was um, iron ore or bauxite or uh, oil in, in, in particular. Um, and, and that was one uh, uh, factor in it. Another one also kind of came from China in that China uh, decided that it wanted to become the most important foreign player in Africa with no kind of sinister motive, but determined to get its hands basically on the, all the wonderful commodities that Africa produces. So there was a great deal of, of investment, Chinese investment, which added to the, uh, the uh, a boom in commodities uh, uh, that, that, that was going on. This, there were other factors too, yeah. the Western governments kind of um, agreeing to debt relief uh, to relieve there, African states. There's been states. A, a considerable amount of support for the African continent, especially for yes. the more democratic states, and there's been, uh, there's been aid, there's been trade, and there's been this realization also that there is perhaps a new scramble for Africa developing, which uh, you know, as, as recently as seven or eight years ago, the Americans weren't particularly interested as to what was going on in the African continent. Financial crisis hit, suddenly the realization of Chinese exploitation of, of raw materials hit, and suddenly the world started paying a more, more serious attention attention to it. Where does it leave the African continent though? Does it leave the African continent in the same way as we've seen for the last 4,950 years as a country to be exploited by elites and by, by foreign powers who come in simply to extract? It's, it's very unlikely that the patterns of, of power and uh, the monopoly of power that various African leaders tried to acquire is, is going to change kind of that much. Um, but what has actually happened is, is that there has been uh, a much kind of broader interest in the commodities that Africa has, if only because Chinese competition for those commodities has set off something of a scramble for Africa. But the most important factor in, in it was not really the scramble for minerals, but the scramble for land. It's something rather similar to what happened with the Romans kind of 2,000 mm. years ago. Because of the 
uh, lack of food supplies in the world in about 2008, one consequence was rising prices of basic food stocks, which led to food riots in countries like Mexico mm. or Egypt and indeed a score of other different countries. So suddenly land, an arable land, became of huge importance. And this led to, if you like, a scramble to find the largest uh, uh, resources of arable land in the world which weren't being used and they were to be found in Africa. So there is a land scramble going on even, in, even mm. as we speak. And what this involves is the, very often the kind of total dispossession of African farmers from their own land, carried out on the instructions of African governments, uh, in connivance with foreign corporations who are desperate to find agricultural land on which they can grow food supplies, not for the benefit of the African population, but for the benefit of populations living outside mm. Africa who are, they fear may well become um, insecure as a result of the lack of food in the future. Uh, and the popular view of the 21st century Africa is this is Africa's century. This is the opportunity. This is about foreign investment. This is about opportunity. This is going to be the continent with, uh, we've got the youngest uh, demographic in the world. This is, the, the future of the African consumer is enormous. But your analysis and your conclusion is somewhat more gloomy than that. And it's, hold on a second. Yes, there is a huge young population on this continent, but without the appropriate economic empowerment, we, we're going full circle, um, and we go back to where we were 5,000 years ago. Well, not quite that far back, <laughs> but um, yes, the, the, that's true, in, in that the Africa does have a huge youthful population, but it has no purchasing power. Uh, the, 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 there has been a kind of uh, the commodity boom which took place in the 21st century has led to overall a huge increase in the sort of statistics of gross domestic product and so on in Africa. So maybe 5% a year and so on has been, there's been an increase of 5% a year. But it's almost been entirely dependent on the commodity boom. And the commodity boom, or parts of it, may well be coming to an end. We now see the price of oil mm -hmm. slumping. Um, and what this is going to do is decimate the income of a whole lot of oil producing states. As it happens, South Africa is on the right side of the equation, not being an oil producing state, will benefit from the lower oil prices and that will actually put a lot of kind of purchasing power in South African pockets. But for countries like Nigeria or Algeria or uh, 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 Angola mm. or Equatorial Guinea or uh, of all the oil producing states, they're all in very serious difficulties now. Mark Meredith, I wish we had more time, but uh, if you want to learn more about it, you've got to buy the book. It's uh, that simple, really. The book is The Fortunes of Africa. The author is Martin Meredith. That is Martin Meredith. been very generous with his time with us this evening on Tonight with Bruce Whitfield. Thank you for watching, and I'll forgive you. You can skip tomorrow night's program if you're reading the book. Until then, bye-bye. Mm -hmm.